we added several new features to the engine to support foliage rendering, and the Fortnite team used those features to ship Battle Royale Chapter 4. At the same time, Jacob over there and the team at Quixel were experimenting with what's possible for photoreal foliage environments, as well as testing out the latest functionality that we've been building for Unreal Engine. So, Jacob's here with us today in the Unreal Editor. Let's explore the environment. And what better way to do that than off-roading? And what better way to off-road than in a Rivian R1T? Not sponsored. Now, Rivian uses Unreal to power their instrument cluster, including 3D visualization of their vehicles. So we worked with them to bring the R1T to life in this experience. Let's head on out, Jacob. Sure thing, on my way. All right. So we're building tools for interactive and dynamic worlds. So here we have chaos physics simulating rocks that tumble as we drive over them. Leaves bend out of the way. And we also added some real-time fluid simulation. God damn, dude, what the fuck? We worked with the team at Rivian to set up Unreal's chaos vehicle model to simulate the suspension of the truck and how the electric motors drive each individual wheel. Chaos also simulates how the tires compress and deform, and MetaSounds enabled the team to precisely resynthesize the sounds of the electric motors and mix them with the ambisonics of the jungle. Okay, but is this real time? Yeah, I, this is real time. This is done in engine. So Rivian provided us with a highly detailed model of the truck, about 71 million polygons Nanites. that we're able to render. In yeah, see, 71 million. Oh, fuck, dude. Does Unreal Engine 5 mean that it will no longer be possible to do the Yandere dev or the the Freddy Fazbear Pizzeria whatever thing where they randomly have a 3D asset that's 5 trillion uh, um, um, polygons and it, fuck, it completely fucks the game? Does this mean that, like, no matter how bad you are at 3D modeling, it'll just, like, auto-smooth it? No, I love that shit. The toothbrush. The toothbrush. You still need to enable it? Yeah, but they will. I want, like, bad devs to do this, and it would be funny for YouTube videos. The toothbrush. In real time, thanks to Nanite. Now, the Rivian not only looks incredibly realistic because of Lumen and Nanite, but also its materials. And today, we're introducing Substrate, our new material framework. <laughs> and to better demonstrate it, let's swap the paint out for opal. Now, of course, you can't order a Rivian with opal body panels, but opal was the internal code name for this project and also a really great demonstration of Substrate's capabilities. The base layer models the iridescent. This is what I mean, guys. Hello. Young Deer Simulator is one messy game full of questionable content, poor scuds, and hair come in different file for such oh, small a item in there a it is. model and as many models merge together because with such UV layout you can't have texture on this object in right places. The heaviest model in the project. A toothbrush. This is a very ugly model. It has 5,592 faces. It's way too much detail for such small item in a video game. Despite its grotesque appearance, it's not a corrupt model. There is- Sorry, I just- Iridescence, refraction, and reflections that occur inside of an opal. And on top of that Holy is a layer shit. representing the polished surface and how light is absorbed as it travels through that clear layer of varying depths. And now we can add back on the dust and dirt layers and notice how the reflection changes when interacting with the dust layer, and that there are no artifacts along the transition from dirt to dust to opal. So Substrate is more expressive, enabling artists to create materials like this with different shading models and compose and layer those materials as they see fit. All right, let's uh, head on out, Jacob. On my way. All right. In terms of performance, Substrate materials that are similar to the current Unreal Engine shading model cost about the same. But now, artists have the freedom to author more complex materials for extremely detailed use cases, like in cinematics and in film. So we're gonna drive- I just hope people remember that there are like lots of things that we enjoy in video games that can't or shouldn't be done with hyper-realistic graphics. For instance, one of the things that makes good first-person shooters fun is the fact that you aren't dealing with the actual level of camouflage and invisibility that real-life soldiers have. In real life, 
uh, it's with with actual soldiers fighting. You're not exactly like running cover to cover in a hallway, like like quick shotting and like quick scoping people. You know? Yeah, like this is great for armor shit. You know? But like, fuck, we need our dooms. Under this fallen tree here, and everything that you've seen up to this point was painstakingly hand-built by the environment team at Quixel. Everything since that fallen tree has been built using our brand new experimental suite of procedural... Remember, Team Fortress 2 couldn't have existed, all right, if every game looked like this. ...content generation tools. Entirely an engine that are flexible, deterministic, and artist-driven. Our guiding principle in building these systems was to empower artists to make tools for artists. So Jacob's going to go ahead and add a procedural assembly to the world. And the cool thing is that it communicates. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Pretty cool. <laughs> and the cool thing is that it communicates with other nearby procedural elements in the scene, like the creek bed. So let's say a designer comes by, wants to direct the player, a procedural assembly to the world. And the cool thing okay, is sorry. that it wants to direct the player to drive to the left. Jacob can simply move the assembly to the right, and everything updates to accommodate that change. Game design is iterative. So Why did everyone just moan? Designer comes by, wants to direct the player to drive to the left. Jacob can simply move the assembly to the right, and everything updates to accommodate that change. Okay, here's the thing that I don't understand. Um, why does the log move? Am I to take it then that these logs don't have any collision attached to them and they're just like ornamental 3D objects? It's procedural? Yeah, but like there's a difference between procedurally altering visual elements and procedurally altering like the, the world you move about in. By the way, that auto update was coded in. That wouldn't surprise me. To drive to the left, Jacob can simply move the assembly to the right and everything updates to accommodate that change. Game design is iterative, so let's say the designer comes back, wants to give the player the choice of going left or right again. Jacob can simply move the assembly back over. Now, the artist who created this assembly also added some additional handles that Jacob can use to art direct where rock slides occur. Allows him to customize the piece a little bit more, make it a little easier for the Rivian to drive by. So we started by handcrafting that original part of the level to set the visuals and art direction for the entire piece and then built out procedural tools that allowed the team to create a much larger play space much more quickly. Now let's see how we can use these procedural tools to make larger sweeping changes. Those are really pretty rocks. So Jacob, let's start by removing some of the trees in this area. Absolutely, that's easy enough actually. All right, <laughs> a little too much. Let's, let's add some trees back in. Okay. And let's also add in some cliff formations, give it a little bit more variability. So the procedural systems are all deterministic. As Jacob is experimenting with different sets of input parameters, once he finds a set that he likes, he can always- Okay, this is literally like rolling Minecraft world seeds. So, so yeah, ba so n this is not like an innate part of Unreal Engine. What this basically is, is what, what they're showing off here is Unreal Engine gives you the ability to create like really modular systems to do this with. Um, it's basically like a pre it's like a tool that allows you to really easily and and really effectively do that kind of like modular um, level design and placement stuff, which is really good by the way, because like for a lot of games, like I'll just take The Witcher Three because it's an open world game that I really like. You have like The Witcher Three world map or whatever here. This this is the world, yeah, like this or whatever, and like a three D modeler did not go and like model all of the world. What they do instead is that they they use kind of like procedural generation to create like a landscape that they then work with building roads and like special areas and placing enemies and stuff. But often what developers were do, will do, especially with really big games, is they'll let the procedural generation handle everything like a couple of passes through and then they'll alter what they get because it's actually less work to design an entire procedural generation engine and tweak it and work with it and iterate on it than it is to like manually design everything in a giant open world. So the ability to do that easier is probably a really good thing. You know, anything that saves time and effort, right? Please go back to it and get out exactly the same results. And the it's less work, but often the output's a lot less creative. No, it, it depends on how it's done. They did that with uh, Subnautica. 
Subnautica has a handcrafted world, but like they didn't individually place every every like kelp, you know. Um, they had systems to kind of build it out, like biome by biome, and then once they had like a good template to work with, they made edits to you know refine the the stuff. I think that's fine for big you know big maps. Procedural systems aren't just placing trees and rocks, but also fog cards, bugs, birds, everything that's needed to bring this environment to life. And everything that you've seen here works at scale. This environment is four kilometers by four kilometers. If we hide all of the procedural elements, we can see that original hand-built area, Ooh. about 200 meters by 200 meters. We believe that there will always be the need for hand-building environments, so we design these procedural systems to be tools for artists that work in concert with hand-built content. Both Substrate and the new procedural tools will be available in experimental form in 5.2. That's really fucking impressive, man. This is such a boring way to make the worst kind of game, like if Skyrim had even less soul. First of all, Skyrim was made, its map was made with that basic set of principles. And second of all, no, I, I disagree entirely. Um, I like, I, I think that, you know, procedural noise to work with is really important for building out larger systems. Otherwise, you're expecting your artists and game devs to work like, what, you're going to have them work for like 18 years to hand construct every part of the world? No, I, I don't like that at all. Not to mention, you know, like the, the, the goal is that you use the procedural generation to create like a, a, a template upon which you build. It's not like you don't look at it and then settle for it. You don't go like, oh, okay. Great, you know, like, oh, it built our world for us, we're done. Yeah, it's better tools for artists. Recycled content? It's not recycled content! God forbid we scale back game, game, game designs. But wait, what's the issue with this? The stuff like this is really, um, is really good and useful. What the fuck?